Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Victoria. OK, um, so when I was thinking about this presentation, and it's just going to be a short 20 minute kind of introduction, I thought it might be nice, since we have a whole host of backgrounds here at this conference, and a lot of what we're interested in is um, the ketogenic diet, and probably many of the talks in this session will um, have some kind of relationship to the ketogenic diet. I thought it could be nice to just kind of uh, have a brief kind of overview of what we know, and then maybe even more importantly, what we don't know. And that's what I kind of actually ended up focusing focusing on, and I added the word questions in here, um, because I think that's as important. So as we probably are aware, the ketogenic diet um, is basically the idea behind it is to target this aspect of cancer metabolism called the Warburg effect, wherein tumors will um, consume large amounts of glucose, and they have a reduced um, um, phenotype where they don't metabolize that uh, energy through their mitochondria quite like our healthy cells do. And for these reasons, it actually ends up benefiting the tumor in many, many ways um, and promotes invasion and metastasis, provides uh, fuels for biomass synthesis to support the growing tumor mass, and then further stimulates growth and proliferation. And so the idea behind this is since glucose is kind of the up, um, up stream metabolite for this process, if we can limit glucose uh, to the tumor, perhaps we can reduce flux through these pathways uh, with the ketogenic diet. And so when we look at efficacy, there's actually been a, a pretty large number of preclinical, so meaning animal model and in vitro research that really supports the idea that the ketogenic diet does have a therapeutic effects, effect in many different types of cancer. And these are some of the types of cancer where this has been shown in animal models. And there's been a number of meta-analyses and reviews on this theme, and I would um, urge you to go look at those if you're interested in looking directly at efficacy. Because I think what we are maybe now in the point of ketogenic diet and cancer research, we're starting to ask a question beyond efficacy. And not just one question, actually many, many questions. And these are some that I'm going to just briefly touch on. So what about the importance of calories? Is it composition of the foods that are consumed in the diet or amount? Uh, what degree of carbohydrate restriction is needed to have a therapeutic effect? How are ketones metabolized in tumors? Are they metabolized? And what effects do they have? Some data suggests perhaps an anti-cancer effect. How can we couple the ketogenic diet with standard of care and other metabolic therapies? What types of fats should be um, included in a ketogenic diet for a cancer therapy? Um, this is a new therapy that is also way more complicated than taking a pill, and so we really need the development of new tools that aid in implementation and assessment of compliance with this therapy. We need to very rigorously assess potential contraindications or situations in this field where the ketogenic diet is not beneficial or maybe harmful. And I just wanted to quickly look over some of the human data that is out there and maybe even talk about potential for prevention. I know that sounds like a lot, but we're going to breeze through these topics kind of quickly. So Dr. Seafried, um, who is a close friend to our lab and has been a mentor to me throughout my career, um, has really put forth this idea about the importance of calories. Um, and he published a few different papers showing that the effect um, of calorie restriction is pretty significant um, in terms of reducing tumor growth. And in fact, in some animal models um, that he has published on, the ketogenic diet was not effective in reducing tumor growth unless it was is also restricted in calories. Um, and of course, anyone that's interested in the ketogenic diet or targeting cancer um, metabolism would really benefit from reading Dr. Seafried's uh, book, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease. And he really lays out an impressive groundwork for understanding cancer in the context of metabolism and then targeting it in that way. And so I think this is an important question that we need to ask. How important are calories? Ketogenic diet may make it easier for someone to calorie, calorie restrict. There's an appetite suppressing effect of the diet, and that's probably an important aspect. Is this clinically feasible? And what about patients who have late stage cachexia where we're worried about them getting enough nutrition? 
what level of carbohydrate restriction is needed? So this was a study in a prostate xenograft animal model looking at a variety of reduced carbohydrate ketogenic diets. Um, and in this study, they actually found that tumor growth and survival did not differ. So th this was suggesting that maybe we don't, maybe there's, um, we can be a little bit more generous than carbohydrate than perhaps originally suggested and still get a therapeutic therapeutic effect in certain scenarios. And this is something that we've seen in the epilepsy community. So um, in large part, the, you know, the ketogenic diet is in and of itself, the classic ketogenic diet is a very, very strict um, carbohydrate restriction. But there are now modifications of the diet, which allow more so more protein, but perhaps a little bit more carbohydrate as well. And are these, those um, types of diets going to be efficacious? And would they um, increase compliance of patients? Ketone metabolism in cancer is a really interesting um, question. And there's been a lot of data that kind of seems to contradict itself. And it probably has to do with the heterogeneous um, kind of biology of tumors. There's definitely studies that have come out and reported, you know, that in these advanced aggressive cancers, such as glioblastoma, you have this very consistent phenotype where the enzymes that metabolize ketones are re greatly reduced but the enzymes that you know, metabolize glucose are greatly enhanced, and in, maybe in those cell lines, ketone metabolism, metabolism is pretty deficient. Um, but then there are other studies also in globoastoma, for example, showing carbon lab uh, labeling of ketone bodies, so these ketones are being metabolized in these tumors. And, you know, so I think that there's probably a differential effect of ketone metabolism between cancer types and between specific cells even within a tumor. But it's important that we understand ketone metabolism. We kind of, in this field, uh, when we're talking about it, we tend to think that overall there's a decreased, perhaps, ability to utilize ketones, especially when it comes to producing ATP for cancer, but we don't know the extent of how ubiquitous this is. And it's important for us to really understand before we continue kind of making generalizations about something so important. What about the composition of fats in the ketogenic diet that is being used? So this is now beginning to be studied in various labs. And I think up until now, um, you know, people are just kind of trying whatever diet they are most interested in or the diet that they perhaps have on hand. But we probably need a more systematic approach to looking at the composition of fats in the diet, because undoubtedly, one could design a very unhealthy ketogenic diet if you're including um, fats that you don't want to include in such a diet. So in this example in gastric cancer um, animal model, so they were starting to look at using medium chain triglycerides specifically and adding in omega-3 fatty acids. And just they showed that this particular composition of that ketogenic diet was efficacious in slowing tumor growth. In another can um, colon cancer model, they were looking at the difference between medium chain and long chain fats, and in this model there was no difference between efficacy. But in other models, there are. So here's another colon cancer model. So same cancer type, um, looking at diets, a uh, ketogenic diet rich in MCTs versus LCTs and seeing that the MCT ketogenic diet reduced tumor size, but the long chain triglyceride ketogenic diet didn't. So this is really suggesting that we need to be taking a closer look at the type of fats that are um, in the ketogenic diets that we're testing. Um, we might need to start standardizing the diets that we're using, just so we can gain a more systematic understanding of um, ketogenic diet uh, efficacy and what might be optimal. Also, you know, I kind of mentioned at the beginning, this is a really um, complicated medical therapy. Um, and it's hard when you're not able to just prescribe a pill and you have a very, you know, kind of simple um, regimen for taking that medicine. 
So it's really important that we have to evolve to also create new compliance um, uh, tools so we can understand what is the best way to apply and then assess compliance in patients. And so this is an example of some of that work that's going on. Again, Dr. Seaford, he's developed the glucose ketone index, which is um, basically he showed that there's a specific relationship between the concentration of glucose and ketones in the blood in these animal models that have shown a therapeutic efficacy. And he said that this GKI can be useful for basically assessing, are you hitting kind of your metabolic target zone in terms of where you want your blood glucose and ketone parameters. So this could be something that is very useful when we start looking at clinical trials and trying to standardize between labs and hospitals and institutes implementing ketogenic therapies. We also need to look beyond the tumor itself. We need to look at effects on health status um, and how this is affecting other aspects of physiology. So one example, which actually seems to be, you know, kind of a, a promising avenue of research, is looking at the effects of ketosis on cancer cachexia. And of course, that's the wasting that occurs. Um, largely lean muscle mass is what we're uh, worried about losing, and it's especially prominent in late-stage cancer patients. And because we know evolutionarily um, kind of a role of ketones is, uh, you know, protein um, uh, sparing, uh, so we think that perhaps ketosis could be useful in preventing cachexia. And so there were um, a group, Tisdale and Fearon, had published a number of papers looking at this possibility. Would a ketogenic diet be able to slow uh, cachexia in this model um, of colon cancer that does exhibit this uh, phenotype? And so they saw that, yes, in this model, a ketogenic diet can decrease tumor growth while allowing the animal to retain both their lean and fat mass better. Um, they actually, they were interested in, in one study specifically looking at, you know, just trying to, to prevent cachexia, and so they compared an MCT ketogenic diet to insulin. And of course, both reduced the cachexic phenotype, but the ketogenic diet, you know, dramatically slowed the tumor growth while the insulin treatment increased it. And this has also been studied in humans. In this study, it didn't actually um, result in um, <clears throat> really any positive or negative effects, but it was a short trial and more data is needed. Um, I'm kind of low on time, so I'm going to move it a little bit. Okay, this is a really important one, narrowing in on mechanisms. Um, there are, this has really kind of been a major focus of work in the past few years, and I would really like to commend Dr. Adrienne Scheck, who we had the honor of hearing speaking earlier today, because I think that she and her lab are really paving the way on answering these really important questions. So we're starting to see that some of these important mechanisms may include things like alteration and oxidative stress, as she showed us earlier today. We see that the ketogenic diet reduces the tumor's ROS production. It also alters gene expression. And what we see is that the effects on the tumor gene expression is such that it seems to kind of normalize the aberrant signaling in the tumor. So the gene expression of a ketogenic diet of a tumor treated with a ketogenic diet looks more closely like the gene expression of a healthy tissue. And so probably, as she mentioned earlier, epigenetics and reprogramming gene expression is really important in the ketogenic diet. And some of these specific pathways that she has um, noted as being important include genes involved in angiogenesis, uh, invasion and metastasis, and, um, vascular permeability, and the hypoxic response. And also, as she showed earlier, um, <clears throat> the ketogenic diet seems to support anti-tumor immunity in a way that you can aid in the uh, body's own defense mechanisms against the ketogenic diet. 
Something that I'm particularly interested in is um, the possibility that, can, uh, that ketone bodies themselves have direct anti-cancer effects. And this has actually been reported largely in in vitro studies, so cell culture models, um, over the past few decades. There's some uh, studies as early as the 70s, I believe, in a variety of cancer cells, um, such as lymphoma, melanoma, brain cancer, kidney, cervical, colon, breast. Um, and we see that when ketones are present, and this seems to be regardless of glucose concentration in these particular cell lines, you get a reduction in their ability to produce energy, also a reduction in their proliferation and their viability. And Dr. Fine, who is here and will speak, I think be speaking immediately after me, showed back in 2012 uh, in a trial that probably the degree of ketosis the um, increase in your blood ketones under the context of the ketogenic diet is very important in getting um, a therapeutic outcome. There have been a handful of reports over the past couple of years um, suggesting that there might be cancer types or specific scenarios where the ketogenic diet would not be efficacious and could be detrimental. Um, just One just came out earlier this year, a couple weeks ago, looking at the BRAF V600E mutation, which is very common in melanoma, suggesting how acetoacetate can actually stabilize mech arc signaling in that tumor, which can promote its aggressiveness. So we absolutely need to be looking at these closely, and we need to understand which cancers would respond well to the ketogenic diet, and perhaps if there are scenarios where we don't want to utilize this therapy, we need to understand that. Um, investigating the ketogenic diet in the context of standard of care is absolutely critical, and thankfully people are doing this, like Dr. Sheck, and she went through this paper of hers earlier today, showing a very nice synergy between radiation therapy and the ketogenic diet in a brain cancer model. This is critical. We have to be investigating, um, uh, doing our work in a way that's clinically translatable. And this has also been shown for chemotherapy and some other cancer models, such as this lung xenograft model, showing that ketogenic diets enhance the effects of radiochemotherapy in these models, and perhaps by increasing oxidative stress. We are also interested in investigating other metabolic therapies. One that I'm interested in is hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And we showed that when um, you combine the ketogenic diet with hyperbaric oxygen, you actually get a very nice kind of potent uh, synergy of these therapies. So what are the optimal kind of administration? We're starting to see many different potential avenues pop up. And we want to be able to understand what's the best way to combine these therapies to get maximum benefit. Is that going to be pre, post, or during standard of care treatment? We don't know. Another example would be things like pairing um, ketogenic diet with specific metabolic drugs such as metformin or in this case a monocarboxylate transporter inhibitor, MCT1 inhibitor. Um, and then we'll just real quickly buzz through some of the human data where we have seen that the ketogenic diet has been used in humans. Um, it does reduce glucose uptake in the tumor by PET imaging. Um, and so that's kind of the goal. So that's good that we know that's actually happening. There's been some really incredible um, beneficial reports in a case study, for example, by Zucoli et al. Combining a restricted ketogenic diet with radiation and chemotherapy and during the treatment, you know, these tumors actually were non-detectable. And sadly, though, after the diet was discontinued, the tumors came back. So this really brings up a question, how long do patients need to be on diet therapy? Will they be ever be able to come off once tumors have disappeared? And that's a big question that patients are going to have. Um, and then I'll just take this one safety and feasibility trial as an example. There's a number of them, but basically there have been a few different safety and feasibility trials looking at the ketogenic diet. Um, a most of them are in late stage cancer patients, mostly uh, metastatic disease post-treatment, so they've already failed standard of care. And these studies have all pretty much concluded that the ketogenic diet is tolerable and it's uh, 
safe and feasible in these patients. They haven't been powered yet enough to look at efficacy, but many of them hint at efficacy. Um, and so we need to continue having these studies um, until we can get the large-scale clinical trials that we need. And I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to uh, pass over those. <coughs> and so thankfully, we are starting to see more and more clinical trials popping up, looking at the ketogenic diet, assessing efficacy um, in various cancer models. And this is, so this is exactly what we need. And I'm really excited to see the results of these studies. Um, and I think the next big question on our minds is prevention. It's probably on everyone's mind um, because almost I assume that everyone in this room knows someone, probably closely, who has been affected by cancer. So what can we be doing in our lives to prevent that potential from happening? And so while the data on the ketogenic diet as a preventative measure for cancer is pretty much theoretical at this point, there really haven't been studies, we see that many, many risk factors of developing cancer are kind of altered in the right direction um, when it comes to pr potentially pr mitigating risk for this disease. And so I would strongly encourage some of these investigators to start looking at this line of um, inquiry as well. So in summary, the diet seems to be effective in many cancer types of animal models. Um, calories might be really important, especially in certain situations. We don't know what level of carbohydrate restriction is necessary, um, so that's something that needs to be explored. Ketone metabolism appears to be heterogeneous in cancer cells, and we need to understand that more. Um, the ketogenic diet seems to be synergistic to standard of care, such as radiation and chemotherapy in certain situations, as well as other metabolic targeted drugs. We need to start paying attention to the types of fats that we're including in our diets because they probably make a big difference. We need more tools to aid in the implementation and compliance to the diet. Um, and we need to optimize the diet composition and how we administer it. <coughs> There are probably lots of mechanisms of the ketogenic diet, so it's important that we continue to uncover those and learn more about the ones that we have already uh, seen, and we need more human trials. So I think that what we're going to see is that, such as uh, what Dr. Sheck was um, telling us this morning, that cancer really does, will require a multifaceted approach. Um, ketosis seems to be a very promising piece to this puzzle, but it will definitely fit into a larger picture of other therapies. And so with that, uh, thank you very much for listening, and I'll take maybe one question I think we might have time for. Thank you.